Hello and welcome to Kirkley's Local Television's Weekly Wind-Up, the programme that brings Kirkley's community news to you. I'm Kyle Warwick and joining me on this week's programme is Kirkley's Council's Head of Parks and Open Spaces, John Fletcher, from the Community's United Sports Project, Andrew Baker, and also joining is his Weekly Wind-Up resident, David Ridgway. Thank you all for being here. Good to see you. We're going to begin this week with a discussion about the state of Kirkley's Council maintained sports pitches. We'll begin with you, uh, John. Firstly, after a wet and winter period, there's been a lot of cancellations in football and rugby calendars, with waterlogged pitches seemingly being the, the big problem. Um, could you tell me, is the condition of sports pitches a high council priority, would you say? Yeah, I think it is. A, it's, the health and well-being of the community is one of um, several key priorities for the council. And obviously the sports pitches contribute greatly to that process, uh, getting people out playing sport. Therefore, uh, the council does its best to maintain a reasonable standard in its sports pitch provision. Uh, we have a lot of sports pitches, something like uh, 190 that we maintain, um, which takes an awful lot of uh, time and effort and money. Um, and, you know, that provides for a lot of people to play sport in the weekend. So, yeah, I would say it's a priority. I think it's really important for the community and it's important that we get the best out of them and important that we present the best pitches possible in the weekend. Absolutely. Um, a lot of teams that play on council sports pitches would like to see more money invested in the long-term maintenance of their fields. Do you see this as being a possibility in the current economic climate? Well, I think for the council to find extra funding for any of its activities at the moment is very difficult. I think that basically if uh, the community is going to get more out of its pitches um, and put more into its pitches, it has to do it itself. Um, and we're talking to a number of sports clubs about you know, how they can help themselves in terms of looking after pitches, providing the icing that goes on the cake, if you like to think of it that way. Um, so that they can help themselves improve the standards that they find, um, you know, we present on a Saturday. Absolutely. Um, Andrew, um, I know that in the, in the papers recently there's been a lot about um, the sort of declining numbers of participants in grassroots sports. Um, do you feel that's having an effect on the kind of funding that goes towards sports pitches in the local area? Well, you're right in saying that there's an, a lot of there's a lot of drop-off in participation, particularly in football, which is reflected in the funding being cut by Sport England. Um, in terms of the usage of grass pitches, it costs, for an adult grassroots 11-a-side team, it costs over a grand to, uh, to, to put a team forward for a league. Um, so that's a lot, a lot of money in, when teams, clubs, players uh, in competition to go and play small-sided football. So the FA and local councils need to really focus on how they can retain these teams so that they keep year on year keep using the grass pitches um, a number of different ways is to sort of obviously to knock the, the costings down on the, the pitches um, also the other one is to try and maintain the pitches because you can't legislate for the weather but mm -hmm. grassroots clubs find that if they have games that are called off over a long period of time then keeping those players interested in playing is really hard and the other thing that there's an issue with is that um, if they have to have games cancelled the pressure's on to do their fixtures so they turn to all weather pitches to get their pitches in, to get their games in which again is an additional cost which impacts so I think in terms of grassroots football it's really hard I think at the moment with the financial climate we're in to keep teams going I think so that's a big big thing and that's something that's uh, going to possibly only get worse really yeah um, do you, John do you see the uh, the reduction in FA funding for grassroots sports affecting the council's ability to maintain council owned sports pitches no um, the FA's um, funding goes into the clubs um, it doesn't come to the council at all 
Um, so it's it's not going to impact at this stage in any case on the um, provision of facilities. Right, um, David. Do you do you think that it's right that the football association doesn't put some money into local authorities for the maintenance of grassroots sports pitches? Um, maintenance of pitches. Probably, I do think that's right that they shouldn't be. Um, putting the money into the maintenance. I, I think the Football Association's money should be better used in ensuring that the, the participants are able to be participating in the sport. I think it's important, and, and not just in football, I think it's important that uh, we, we strike the right balance uh, right across the board of sports. Um, we've just had a remarkable um, turn of, of um, of uh, results in Russia in the Winter Olympics and the Winter Paralympics, uh, and all these um, minority sports, particularly in the Paralympics, require funding. And football, because it's the, the the premier winter sport, or they think it is. Of course, it's really rugby. That's just a personal matter. Um, <laughs> That they think that they should take the, the King's Prize to all the funding that's available. And life just isn't like that. And of course, funding is becoming more and more difficult. I, I'm really delighted to hear John saying that the, the, uh, there is a, a, a quite heavy encouragement for the clubs who play on the council owns pitches uh, being encouraged to take on some of that maintenance for themselves. It's exceptionally good news. Uh, if that maintenance is being done by the direction of the council and, and John's teams um, so that the maintenance is done to a standard which is acceptable, then that's, that's really good news. Absolutely. And that's a far better use of the money than, than just doling it out. Absolutely. Um, I mean, there has been comments from Sports Minister Helen Grant that there may be a case for clubs to argue that local authorities are overcharging for teams to play on essentially substandard sports pitches. Do you think it's fair to keep charging the same rate to sports teams to play on pitches that may be I think there's an argument to be quality? made. I think there's an argument to be made to allow sports teams to play on school pitches because uh, often school pitches are exceptionally underused. Uh, they are quite well maintained within the budget of those schools and if they're underused and, they're, and, and, and that's causing pressure on the local uh, authorities' pitches to be overused, then there's got to be an imbalance. Schools have got to come back into the community. They can't just hide behind their, their, their palisades and pretend that they are uh, different to the rest of the world. They've got to engage. Is that something you agree with, John? Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with that. There's no point having all these facilities stood, um, you know, idle in a weekend when other facilities are being overplayed. Because it's the overplaying that causes as much problem as anything. Um, playing on pitches when they're waterlogged or when they're less than fit causes a major problem and adds to the problems as we go on through the season of lack of lack of grass cover um, and poor underfoot conditions, which I think you're referring to. Um, there is a lot within the gift of um, the clubs themselves to try and protect the pitches when they're in that condition. And of course, there is now a lot of onus on the referee, poor soul, to make the decision <laughs> about whether or not a match goes ahead in a weekend. Um, because, you know, we can't, we do, sometimes we, we call a, a, you know, every game off as early as a Wednesday, but we can't be there if it throws it down on a Friday night to make the local decision on a Saturday or a Saturday or a Sunday. Um, so it's, it's a very tough one for us, but um, I don't think clubs are generally un, you know, overcharged. Um, I think that it's important for people to realise that the council massively subsidises this sport within this local authority. We don't recover the cost of um, maintaining the pitches or anything like the cost of maintaining pitches um, from the clubs that use them. That's a deliberate policy from the council to support local sport. 
And, you know, although those clubs, as has been said, find it very difficult to make ends meet, you know, with charges from leagues, charges for referees, charges for the pitch and, and what have you, it's, it's still a very modest cost from the council in terms of um, their higher charges mm -hmm. compared to the cost of maintenance. It doesn't pay a fifth of the cost. So it's really important that people understand that. Having said that, you know, what goes on in the future if local government continues to face, um, you know, difficulties in finance is anybody's guess. But um, if we were to say that funding is to be reduced, then the clubs are going to have to set in, uh, step in and um, help themselves more than they do now. Um, maybe not monetary, but in effort terms. Um, and finally, as a final question for this part to you, yourself, Andrew, I um, was wondering, do you think there could be more money feeding down from elite sporting leagues down into the sort of grassroots? I know the, the FA sort of struggles with its own funding, but the Premier League is a, a kind of elite institution of its own that is notorious for not feeding money down even into the lower professional leagues, let alone the, the grassroots. Do you think this is something that could be done better? Well, the, the debate is out there at the moment because the uh, obviously the FA are struggling. They've they've had what eight hundred thousand been taken off their uh, their grassroots participation budget. So, and then they the look at the Premier League, this massive cash cow that are uh, just reaping in billions of pounds through uh, TV rights and things like that, and they're looking at what can they do and I think there's a definite argument as to see how, how they can support and I mean offering just a couple of million um, would, would support the FA in, their, in the, a lot of their initiatives as well with the local authority and sort of developing grassroots pitches because without, without grassroots football, without sort of um, the local authorities having pitches available, the Premier League there's not there's nowhere is it is you know the players are not going to be coming through um so yeah i think there needs to be there needs to be a, a greater support from the, the premier league um definitely that's great thank you well this has definitely been an interesting discussion so far but it doesn't stop here it's one that you can get involved with online you can do so through our email info at kirkleyslocaltv.com and you can also do so on our brand new Twitter page by searching at The Weekly Windup. Please join us after the break for more debate. And welcome back to The Weekly Windup. We're now going to jump straight into a discussion about the enforcement vehicles that many of you will have seen driving around the borough. Um, there seems to be a bit of uh, confusion as to exactly what the enforcement vehicle's purpose is. So we have, uh, from, from the local authority, we have Councillor David Ridgway. Um, would it be possible for you to enlighten ourselves and our audience as to exactly what the purpose of these enforcement vehicles well, as is. Well, as far as I can, Kyle, my understanding is that these vehicles were brought in in order to film uh, people who are parking their cars inappropriately and often illegally, and particularly outside schools. Now, outside most schools, probably all schools, there are zigzags. Those zigzags are designated non-parking areas. But so many parents who, for some particular reason, feel that if they can't drive their children actually into the classroom, they will drive their children to the, the, to the school gate, and outside the school gate they'll find the zigzags, and consequently they ignore them. And those zigzags are there for two very specific reasons. Firstly, to maintain the degree of safety on the roads for the children going into school, and secondly, to ensure that traffic does continue to flow. Uh, those uh, enforcement vehicles are there to actually take the numbers of the, uh, the, the, the car numbers of those vehicles which are parking in, in, inappropriately, and they then can take those onto the, uh, onto the courts to find them. Okay, doc. So I think uh, I think the main misconception has been really that um, some people thinking that these vehicles are for 
antisocial behaviour? No. Not at all? No. No. Um, I was wondering as well, what, what do our other guests think about these vehicles, Andrew? Um, I think it's a good idea having these vehicles going yeah, on. Yeah, well, the like yourself, I didn't really know what they were, what the, the purpose was prior to, to meeting you today. But I think anything that obviously protects is, is an element of safety for children and, people and the general public, um, I think is a good thing. I suppose where people look at things, if they're, they're looking at illegal parking in general, then I suppose people resent that and uh, will think that it's just another money-making thing. But I think... <laughs> If it's if it's marketed as it being something that's is is enforcing safety, then I think then that's uh, can only be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, John, do you do you think the local authority could maybe have done more to um, get out there what the vehicle's exact purpose was before rolling the vehicles out into usage? Uh, I'm not sure, but if if there are people who are um, who need to know now, then maybe this programme will help a few. But, um, you know, maybe, yes, that we need to promote more the, the really valuable um, service that this is providing. Because anything, as has been said by the other two panellists, that promotes child safety, particularly walking to school, which we'd all like to see them involved in, um, is, is to be welcomed. And uh, Councillor Ridgway, would you would you refute the statement, or would you refute refute, refute the idea that this is simply a money spinner for the council? Um, I don't think it is a money spinner for the council because I don't think they they get too much in from the fines. Uh, whether they actually cover the costs for the vehicles, I suspect they probably do. But on top of that, uh, out of a, a three hundred million pound budget that the council has to deal with. The, the, the percentage will be extremely small. But I would like to say this, that in almost every aspect of life, you can be either reactive or proactive. And I think that this is a gross example of reactive decision-making, in that instead of the schools being proactive in looking after the needs and welfare of their children outside the school gates, they have taken the attitude, it's outside the school gates, it's nothing to do with us. And I don't think that's really appropriate in life today. If instead they did what they do in America, where the senior pupils actually are looking after the pupils themselves outside the school gates, and they are expected so to do by the public at large, then the traffic problem immediately goes away because the kids themselves, the students themselves, are telling the, the drivers, move on, move on. Um, there, there are also, this, this could only be happening in Britain, there are two sorts of zigzags. But you didn't know that, did you? I definitely didn't. No, no, no. There, there, are, <laughs> there are statutory zigzags and there are non statutory zigzags. And the only way you can tell the difference is by reading the plate outside the school. If it's non statutory, you can't get done if you park on them. If they're statutory, you can be hauled into court. Now, where is the sense of sensibility of that? How is an ordinary person going to know? And why aren't the parents making their children walk to school anyway? <laughs> well, certainly got a little bit heated here, but um, perhaps that's an, an opinion that you agree with. Again, you can contact us on our email, info at Kirkley's Local TV, or via our Twitter page by searching at the Weekly Wind-Up. We're going to move straight on now to our final news item of the week. Um, this is the news that a grieving Huddersfield mum has hit out at the sentence that was given to the driver that killed her son. Whilst Judith Hughes, mother of James Loops Haig, who died on January 2nd last year, states that her family never wanted the driver to see prison. They do feel that a one-year driving ban, 80 hours community service, 12-month community order and paying over £60 of costs is no more than a slap on the wrist for a person convicted of causing death by careless driving. I was wondering, do you, do you as panellists feel that Mrs Haig has a point? Do you feel that... Yes. You do? Yes, I do. I think that there is... Um, a lot of misunderstanding uh, as to how the court process actually works. 
uh, I think that the families of, uh, uh, of the deceased are invariably not told what the result of a court case will be in, in these circumstances. I've not read the case in detail, I've only read what's been reported in the press. But um, the death by careless driving is a considerably uh, different matter to ordinary uh, manslaughter or indeed to murder. Uh, and, and murder, of course, carries a mandatory life sentence. Manslaughter carries uh, several years in prison. Um, the, the, the mother of the, uh, of, of the deceased has said she didn't want this man to go to prison. Um, one has to question what, therefore, did she expect to happen? If the CPS felt that they could have got a, a harsher sentence, they would have charged the person with a, a, a higher tariff uh, sent, um, uh, a higher, a higher tariff uh, offence uh, because it wasn't done. Therefore, the, the, the result of the, the actual case having been proved guilty is, that, uh, what, what is, is what you now see in front of you. The matter is that, the, that Mr. Haig died. He shouldn't have died. He died because the perpetrator was driving inappropriately. Now, if Parliament decides that this is an inappropriate matter, they should raise the tariff on the sentence. They should actually state categorically what the level of sentence should be. That hasn't been done, or if it has been done, the tariff has been set far too low. Absolutely. And that information should be given to the families. But the families don't get that information because they're not represented in court, are they? Right, but is this, is this a problem that you could see being solved? Do you think that... Um the sort of victim's family should be allowed representation in terms of being provided with a lawyer in, in such cases? Andrew? Um, I think this is a tough one, that. Um, well, to be honest with you, I don't, I'm, I'm not well versed in, uh, in that sort of thing, so I can't really offer an opinion. What I can say is that, I, I don't know, if, you, if you're looking at somebody that has died, like we've, we've said, to be only banned for one year, whether it was his own fault or whatever, it seems a very lenient, lenient ban. If you um, if you get caught drink driving, you can be banned for eighteen months, two years. You get sent down, and and that's just without any accident happening or anything like that. So, um, it looks outrageously lenient for for something like that. Um, whether there can be some sort of comeback on that, then. As it, as you say, that maybe that that's something that needs to be looked at, but um, I think I think something needs to be stiffer, a stiffer sentence for someone. Like Absolutely. Serious as that. Is that something you agree with, John? Do you think the the sentence for somebody who's killed a person should automatically exceed the sentence for somebody who's been caught just drink driving? I think it's a decision for the courts, frankly, and. Um, you know, they've made a decision in this case. I think everybody would understand uh, the feeling of James's family. Um, nobody could dispute that. But, you know, the court has heard all the details of the case and uh, the judgment has been made upon those details. Um, I can't possibly comment on having not heard the details. It just, you know, is a very sad situation. And uh, like I said, we can all understand how James's family feel. Absolutely, and uh, as our condolences do go out to James's Absolutely. family, hopefully they sort of come into terms a little bit with uh, what happened to the son. Um, I notice in the list of uh, of punishment that the victim surcharge of, of whatever it is sixty is, uh, pounds. No, no, that was the court cost. Oh, right. There was no victim surcharge mentioned. I presume that it wasn't mentioned in the examiner either. Yeah. But I presume there was fifteen pounds of victim surcharge actually added onto this list, but I've never really found out what the victim surcharge is used for. It ought to be used for the victims or the mm. families of the victims. Absolutely. Um, well, that's all we have time for this week. Um, hopefully you'll get in contact with us about any of the stories that you've heard on today's show. Once again, you can do that via our email, info at kirkleyslocaltv.com, or you can do so on Twitter by searching at the Weekly Windup. Thank you to our guests for joining us this week. It's been an interesting discussion. Please join us next week for another edition of Kirkley's Local Television's Weekly Wind-Up. Goodbye. <laughs>